footsteps behind you as you enter the woods. Night draws back its cave. Light illumines your path. Open your eyes. Listen. Welcome to Dark Softly Tales. Dark stories for dark hearts. I'm Mav Sky. Good evening and welcome to your nightmares and your favorite horror storytelling podcast, Dark Softly Tales. This is your host, Mav. And for episode 50, we have a ghost story for you tonight called The Bridge. Guaranteed to make the hair stand up on your arms. (laughs) That sounded like an infomercial. You know, maybe I should make an infomercial for one of these episodes one of these times. That would be really fun. Anyway, getting back on track. The Bridge, one of my favorite short stories, was written by Indiana native Alec Cizak. I've known Alec for a long time, and he's one of the best storytellers and story editors that I know. In truth, I had no idea what a good story editor was until years and years and years ago when I was subbing my works to magazines and I had finally started getting accepted. I subbed one of my stories um, called Mantra and you guys might remember that from episodes 8 and 9. If not, go back and check it out because it's one of the creepiest stories I've ever written. Anyway, I sent Mantra to Alec who I believe was editing a magazine at the time called All Due Respect. I was still a relatively new writer, and the story was on the rough side, Um, needless to say. When Alex sent the story back to me, all edited up, I was absolutely amazed what he had done with the story. He had polished it like a diamond. It was amazing. Here's the secret to a good editor. A good editor has a passion for a good story, and they will edit with the rhythm and the flow of a story. And, and this is a big one, and also with the author's intention. Um, Someone who isn't the greatest editor, their ego will get in the way. They won't really see the diamond in the story. They'll just rip it to pieces to show the author what's wrong with it. And they don't go with the flow of the piece And they also don't go with the attention that the story, that the author sets for the piece. Um, I hope I said that in a way that you can understand. But there's a very big difference. It's, I think a good story editor is just, it's like a diamond or a star. They're just very precious. And I think that, that's, that's what Alec is. He's very, um, very rare. On top of that, Alec is an excellent writer and storyteller as you will soon see. So stay tuned after the story where you can discover where to find Alec and pick up a few of his books. A quick reminder that I'm sending out the Name My Scarecrow giveaway on Wednesday. So go sign up for the Dark Softly Tales newsletter, which you can find the link in the show notes, or you could also just go to my website, darksoftlytalepodcast.com, scroll to the bottom, and you can see where you can sign up. The winner will be announced, uh, I'm actually not sure when I will announce that. I've been too busy to actually figure out the details of this contest. All I know is that I will have it fleshed out and ready to go on October the 21st, which I believe is a Wednesday. Now, I think it's time for a ghost story. It's dark. I see fog rolling through the forest. But if you look closely, there is a path just wide enough for a car and tire tracks leading to a bridge that is suspended by time itself. Take a deep breath. There's nothing to be afraid of. Is there? Take my hand and hang on tight. As we journey into the dark, softly.
The Bridge by Alec Cizak. Almost four in the morning. Why the hell was he standing at the edge of a ravine in Raw Creek, Indiana? Stupid stunt to make peace with Laura, his 17-year-old daughter. Damn Sheila for pushing the girl on him at her most difficult age. He hadn't really been there the last six years of her life. She reminded him every day. You think you can just say sorry and it's all good? Didn't matter the divorce had been Sheila's idea. The judge had given her custody. and She accepted until her second marriage collapsed and she needed space. What about his needs? He'd finally gotten himself in shape, ready to head out into the adventurous world of middle-age dating. And now he had his kids at home, keeping him from meeting women at the Friday night St. Bridget singles dance. Laura didn't care. He'd ask her to babysit her younger sister, and she'd tell him she was meeting friends. Vanessa's not my problem, she'd say. Why don't you call mom? Sweetheart, he'd say feeling stupid for pleading with a child. Your mother is finding herself. I don't even know what that means. Probably something she read in a magazine. We got to take care of each other until she comes back from Turkey or Greece or wherever the hell she's gone to. She refused to call him dad. Mom's in Morocco, Daryl. You know that. And he'd give in. He'd stay home and watch Disney DVDs with Vanessa, who still loved him unconditionally. she just turned seven, as she liked to tell folks any time he took her to a burger joint or the Big Mart in Lublin. She sang to herself in the car, in her room drawing pictures on a sketch pad, or in the bathroom while she brushed her teeth. Every night at the dinner table, she asked him about his day at work. An absolute angel. He called her Little Miss Redemption. She liked to be tucked into bed before sleeping. She liked it when he read her Ramona books or took her to the movies. Despite her mother having purchased a smartphone for her when she was four, she found little use for it and often left it under a pile of clothes on the floor. She taught him how to comb her hair in the morning and put it in pigtails the way she preferred. She showed him how to construct the perfect peanut butter and jelly sandwich for her lunchbox. Anytime his students crawled under his skin and made him want to open the windows in his classroom and toss them out, he thought of Vanessa in instant calm. Little Miss Redemption. Laura, on the other hand, had barely spoken with him since moving into his apartment. She spent most of her time at the mall in Maryville. He'd seen her there once. He had been shopping for a new battery for his laptop. He watched her lounging and around near the food court with her friends, all focused on their individual phones. When she did come home, she went straight to her room. If she agreed to eat dinner, she'd sit at the table, wearing earbuds, listening to monorhythmic noise loud enough for the rest of the world to hear. Earlier that week, he'd entered her room without her permission. She was reading something on the internet. Paragraphs of text. The idea of her deciphering something longer than a tweet thrilled him. What are you looking at? He said. She told him about Raw Creek, a small town ten miles south of Bloomington. A dirt road called Cooley Avenue stopped at the edge of a ravine. The forest on the other side had a reputation of being so haunted locals never entered it. She said a covered bridge had once connected the road to the forest, but it collapsed while a woman crossed it to meet her lover. Classic ghost story material. He had rolled his eyes. You think it's so funny, Daryl, she said. Go on down there and see for yourself. He played along. See what? So she explained, You park your car at the edge of the ravine. Just after four in the morning, a woman opens the back door and gets in behind you. You don't look at her. You don't talk to her. 
You act like she ain't even there. Once she's in, the bridge appears. You put the car in neutral, and it rolls across on its own. He laughed. Sweetheart, he said. If that were true, I'd know of it. He taught history, and his speciality was Indiana. He'd never read anything about a haunted bridge in Rock Creek. I've studied on this, Daryl. It's all over the internet. He apologized and let her finish. On the other side, she gets out of the car, and you put it in reverse and roll across. Again, don't look at her. Don't speak to her. Turn around while you're headed back. If you do everything right, as soon as you return to the other side, the bridge will disappear. Again, he made the mistake of showing interest. And if you screw it up, you get her fixed on you, she said. She'll take something from you, something real valuable. Hmm, sounds serious. It's no joke, Daryl, she said. People who've done it and messed up, they've said the door closed when the woman got out, and they were back on the other side of the ravine without driving in reverse across the bridge. (sighs) Well, that's incredible. He wanted to change the subject. You don't believe it? She said. You think I'm stupid? Sweetheart, get lost, she said she hated him. Nothing new. He moved to the door, a sick feeling in his stomach, like fried food twisting his insides. Then he stopped. I know these things are important to you, he said. Doubt it. The smell of perfume and hairspray filled the air in her room. Posters of singers, young men who looked as fragile as Farvarge eggs, covered her walls. He asked her what he could do to demonstrate he cared about her, cared about her feelings, her interests. He figured she'd suggest buying her tickets to a concert or something. Take me to Raw Creek. Anticipation washed over her face like someone on the verge of finding God. Can you do that, Dad? I want to see the bridge. He said he'd think about it. Her wide, hopeful eyes dimmed. She jammed her pink buds into her ears and waved him off. He'd spent the next day at school debating whether or not he should give in to the silly request. He'd studied urban folklore in college. The idea of putting a local myth to the test fascinated him. By the time his fifth period seventh graders rumbled into the classroom, fresh with energy from lunch and ready to raise hell, he'd become obsessed. Here would be an opportunity to sit in a car for five hours and force his daughter to get to know him better. Let's leave the smartphone and earbuds at home, shall we? He'd tell her. He could fly his skepticism about ghosts and other nonsense under the radar, demonstrate he understood the world better than she did, and maybe, just maybe, she'd take him seriously as a father. That night, he did his own research. There were videos on YouTube of teenagers sitting in darkness, waiting for the woman and the bridge and encountering nothing. Had his daughter seen them? Looking further into the matter, he found chat boards with testimonies from people claiming to have gone through with the ritual, or whatever it was, and having returned with dreadful consequences. They'd made the mistake of glancing in the rearview mirror at the woman in the back seat. Most of them described her as pale with stringy black hair. This reinforced his skepticism. The ghost, as it were, seemed to have been inspired by Asian horror films and their American imitators. 
One theory cast her as a child who'd been fishing on the bridge when it collapsed. She'd fled for the other side, but obviously didn't make it. Why four in the morning, then? What kind of child went fishing that early? Another said she'd been abused at home, had decided to run away, and a tornado had splintered the bridge as she crossed it. The most recent theories involved a woman in her 20s who'd taken up an affair with a married man. She'd meet him just before dawn every morning in the forest. Mother Nature intervened once more, this time with a bolt of lightning. Those who claimed to have made eye contact or spoken with the woman said things didn't feel right afterwards. They ended up on the other side of the ravine without actually driving across the phantom bridge. Just as Laura has said would happen. They promised to keep people updated, but never returned to the chat board. Unable to reconcile the differences between the articulate, written accounts and the goofy, booze and weed laden videos, Daryl decided it best to investigate it, initially on his own. If it were as benign as he suspected, he would take Laura there the next night. He waited until the weekend, Friday. He could spend Saturday recuperating. He left just after 11, checked on Vanessa. Laura had been out with friends and returned, angry that she had to be at home. You want to go to Rock Creek tomorrow, he said. I need you here tonight, making sure Vanessa is okay. She argued that her sister was already asleep, so he said, we can skip this trip altogether, if you like. She stuffed her buds into her ears and turned her back to him. He cruised down I-65 with a half moon painting the rolling farmlands in electric blue. The highway remained empty, for the most part, with the exception of the jog through Indianapolis. He drove another 60 minutes, past Columbus and Bloomington, before getting off at the Rock Creek exit. Neither his GPS nor any map sites on the internet recognized a Cooley Avenue. He had to stop at a 24-hour shell station just off the highway to ask. The attendant, a teenager who took his time removing his eyes from a smartphone, spoke to him through bulletproof glass. He tossed his bangs to the side of his head and said, Yeah? As though his attention were no less valuable than an ancient pharaoh's. Daryl asked him if he knew how to get to the haunted bridge. The kid smirked. You going to hang with Gertie? Daryl must have looked confused. Gertie's the girl, said the attendant. See that road there? He pointed to a street running along the other side of the station. Take that about a mile. Houses will start disappearing on you. That's how you know you're getting close. Put your brights on. You'll come up on a dirt road that's got a busted fence on both sides. That's your ticket, buddy. Just follow it up until it stops. Like I said, keep those brights on. You don't want to roll into the ditch. Daryl thanked him. And buddy, said the attendant, she decides to ride with you. Keep your eyes out of that rear view. You don't want her taking nothing from you. You hear me? He thanked the attendant again, not sure how to react to his last comment, and got back into his car. As the ranch-style houses gave way to barren fields, he flipped his brights on. Early morning mist rose off the undisciplined pavement. He veered left onto a road flanked by jagged posts with sagging barbed wire. Dirt and gravel crunched under his tires as he approached the ravine. He slowed and put the car in park, a few yards shy of the edge. He left his brights on and stepped out to peer over the side. Trees and shrubs filled in the valley below. Maybe it had once been a river, or possibly the creek town was named after. Rotting planks of white and burgundy wood poked from the foliage. They pointed, like fingers, to the forest across the gorge. 
None of the usual sounds of the night surrounded him. No crickets, no small animals moving through the grass. Aside from his idling Honda, there was only silence. The air chilled him, and the mist swirled around his feet. He wondered, right then, what the hell was he doing there? He hustled back to his car and turned off the brights. He wanted to sleep. He hadn't stayed up past midnight in years. The clock on the radio read 3.59. How absurd to have wasted gas driving down here. The numbers turned to four, and he held his breath. Nothing happened. Well, so much for that. He grabbed the gear shift, ready to put the car in reverse. Light footsteps snapping twigs on the ground approached from the passenger side. The back door opened. Someone plopped down on the seat behind him. The door closed. He ground his teeth and fought the urge to look in the rear view mirror. Without thinking about it, he shifted to neutral. The car rolled forward. He put his hands on the steering wheel. A burgundy-covered bridge with white trim materialized. The wheels banged a steady thump, thump, thump over the floorboards. He'd expected the woman, or whatever was in the car with him, to make some strange noise. He imagined a ghost from an Asian horror movie, dripping wet, maybe wheezing. As these thoughts tiptoed through his mind, he noticed the thing behind him had begun to breathe loudly. It knew he was thinking about it. He forced himself to picture Mrs. Hunt, an algebra teacher at Haggard Middle School he'd wanted to go out with, but had never found the guts to ask. She always wore a high-cut, light purple dress on casual Fridays. Her thighs had been handcrafted by God. The eighth grade boys called her a fold. He learned from the internet that stood for fine old dime, which, apparently, had replaced the term M-I-L-F in these tender, more polite times. The breathing behind him got louder, anxious, desperate. Better to think of something pure. His daughters. He saw Laura, angry scowl on her face, brooding all the time. No good. Wasn't it her fault he was here? Better to think of Vanessa. How thrilled she'd been the first time he picked her up for his visitation weekend after she started kindergarten. Her mother had dressed her in Oshkosh overalls, covered with red flowers and yellow butterflies. She sang the Itsy Bitsy Spider every time she visited, when her mother still had custody. She hadn't sung it since moving in with him, preferring instead pop songs her sister liked. The thing in the back seat crooned in a hushed and raspy voice. The Itsy Bitsy Spider He wanted to turn around and smack it. They were close to the other side now. The headlights on his car opened up the forest. Massive birch trees and sycamores huddled close together. Their skinnier branches resembled fingers, arched to grab anyone who got too close. The car stopped on its own. He waited for the thing behind him to leave, but it didn't. It just kept singing. Why won't you get lost? He clenched his lips so he wouldn't say it out loud. He closed his eyes, thinking that would calm him. Was it playing a game with him? Taunting him? What the hell was taking it so damn long? He accidentally opened his eyes, staring directly into the rear view mirror. The woman's lovely blonde hair spilled around the shoulders of her summer blue dress. She glared at him, her mouth open, her entire face in shock, as though he'd done something terrible to her. 
She got out and slammed the door. The bridge vanished. Daryl's car had returned to the other side of the ravine as though it had never moved at all. Damn it! He tried to convince himself it had been a hallucination. He'd investigated it so much his mind had put on a show. Maybe he had fallen asleep and dreamt it. As he drove to the highway, he couldn't shake the feeling that somehow, in some way, the woman had stayed with him. He checked the rearview mirror, expecting to catch her staring at him. He wanted to get back to Haggard, as though that would somehow prevent any tragedy he'd invited. What did they mean, on the internet, when they said the woman would take something valuable? His life? He'd just turned 40. His colleagues ribbed him, called him a fossil. Didn't seem so old now. He remembered all the plans he'd made. To write a book about Indiana's role in the Civil War. He wanted to go to Europe, something he hadn't been able to afford thanks to his wife and kids. He imagined his daughters growing up from here on without their father. His foot constantly smashed the pedal to the floor, sent his Honda rocketing over 80 miles an hour. Before he realized this might be how the woman got him, a car accident. Convenient. Nobody would know what really happened. Jesus. He could see his daughters at his funeral, Laura chewing gum and looking at her phone, while Vanessa, God bless her, cried her little eyes out. He roared into the parking lot next to his building, hopped out of the car, and ran up the steps to his apartment. His hand shook as he maneuvered his key into the bolt lock on his front door and whipped it open. He nearly fell into Laura's bedroom. She'd passed out wearing clothes she had on the night before. Her earbuds were still in her ears, despite the blank screen on her smartphone. He shook her shoulders. Laura? Laura, sweetheart, wake up. Please. She took a breath and rolled away from him. Laura, he said. Sweetheart, I know things haven't been great, but please, 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 know that I love you, even if that doesn't mean anything to you now. She slapped his hand away. Oh my god, she said. You woke me up for that? He sat next to her, refused to move until he heard his youngest daughter. Vanessa, little Miss Redemption, greeted her Saturday morning with music. She'd understand. She'd be happy to see him. He started down the hallway toward her room. And then he stopped. There were two voices. Vanessa's and a breathy, raspy woman's. Carried through her door in unison. Park your car at the edge of the ravine. Just after four in the morning, a woman opens the back door and gets in behind you. You don't look at her. You don't talk to her. You act like she ain't even there. When she's in, the bridge appears. You put the car in neutral and it rolls across on its own. hope you enjoyed this lovely dark tale. Now, a little about the author and where to find him. Alec Zizak is a writer and filmmaker from Indianapolis. His fiction has appeared in several journals and anthologies. He is also the editor of the fiction journal Pulp Modern. 
You can find the bridge and other chilling tales in his horror story anthology called Lake County Incidents. You can find this book by going to Amazon, typing in Alec Cizak's name, A-L-E-C-C-I-Z-A-K, and the title Lake Side Incidents. While you're on Amazon, be sure to click follow on his author profile and check out his other books. You can also find him on Twitter at Alex Cizak and on his YouTube channel, ACTV. All of the links are in the show notes. Remember to give Dark Softly Tales podcast a rating by tapping on the little stars of whatever app you are listening on, or even better, leave a review. This ensures we'll be able to keep bringing new stories for the long haul. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Dark Softly Tales, and until next week, shine bright, dark hearts.